Um, can you hear me? All right, Is, we have the full audience on. Fantastic. My name is Neka Uzo, and I'm happy to join you from sunny Southern California, more specifically, the unceded territory of the Chumash people. Today, we are gathered to talk about innovation, but we can't talk about building a better future without acknowledging the past and the present that our legacies are built upon. Today, we are joined by people all across the world. And in the chat, I'd love for you to drop the indigenous lands that you're joining us from. If you're uncertain about where that might be, you could head to native.land.ca or native-land.ca to share what indigenous lands that you're joining us from. I am with these four brilliant people who are building phenomenal solutions to optimize their energy systems and electrify the hard to green sectors. Each of them will give five minute Ignite style talks. That means five minutes and 20 slides about the work that they're doing. We're gonna stop in the middle and at the end for some Q&A. So as questions and comments come across your mind, please drop them in the chat, um, as well as the Q&A function that allows you to update, upvote questions that you find to be interesting. So now coming to the stage, I have Laureen Merua of Alchemer and Paul Gaucher of Heliogen. Thank you so much, Neka. Hi everyone, oh, feel free to click through Sarah. Thank you. So there are so many reasons for why we are finally reacting to the current climate crisis that we're facing. One of them being that there are negative economic effects to the climate crisis that are felt around the world. The other being that companies like yours are increasingly facing social pressure to reduce their carbon footprint, along with the fact that the climate crisis is just worsening inequality both locally and globally. And there are solutions to this, right? Around 70% of the world's processes can be directly electrified. So let's say we green the grid, then that serves that. But then there are these other 30% in which they cannot be directly electrified, at least not practically. And those are termed hard to abate sectors. So if I try to just directly electrify this sector, it's either gonna be too costly, inefficient, or as I said, impractical. And these sectors represent um, industries such as aviation, shipping, cement, uh, steel manufacturing, as well as plastics, and long haul trucking. And combined, these very critical sectors contribute to around 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a, it's a pretty large chunk, right? We can't just ignore it. So considering these sectors, how do we decarbonize them? How do we decarbonize these sectors in a quick manner and one in which it's profitable and can be applicable you know, across globes? And that's where the beautiful two words come into play, green hydrogen, which I'm sure you've heard of before at this point. You can use green hydrogen as a fuel in your truck, works just like your gasoline. You can use it to uh, store energy over long periods of time, and you can use it in the agriculture space. And how you make it is you take renewable power and water, put them through an electrolyzer, and out comes your hydrogen and oxygen. And this equipment can be suitable for multiple sectors mentioned. Now, why are we all obsessed with hydrogen? At least I am. Well, for one, it's a gas and we're so used to working with gases already, right? We have an expansive infrastructure around natural gas already built. So we understand what it takes to transport it. The other though, is that it falls in line with this electrify everything notion, right? You're still electrifying these sectors. It's just that you've added this additional step so that they can decarbonize in a profitable manner. And these water electrolyzers exist today, but they have faults, right? So you have proton exchange electrolyzers. Um, and unfortunately, those rely on very scarce metals. So iridium, which is mostly from Africa, South Africa. Then you have alkaline electrolyzers, which are cheap, but they're very bulky. Like you're not gonna wanna put this thing for on-site production. 
and they have very corrosive liquids inside. What do we do? You combine the best of both worlds, right? You take the aspects that you like about one and the other without the negatives. And thus comes out the anion exchange water electrolyzer. At Alchemer, we're making green hydrogen a reality by developing anion exchange water electrolyzers that can produce green hydrogen at low cost and hit all the metrics necessary to serve our customers, which could include you. These metrics include the low cost. So we've managed to reduce capital cost of our electrolyzers by more than 300% compared to existing solutions. Footprint is important and our electrolyzer is such that you can do on-site or off-site production and you can couple to renewable power. So this will be our first product, one megawatt single stack. You can imagine that this is going to be sitting at a refueling station for trucks, let's say. And then our next product, which builds upon that, will be multi megawatt skids. And these are more suitable for the chemical sector. Um, so surprise fertilizers for agriculture use a lot of hydrogen today already. Now, these are great, but it will take some time to get there, right? Not too far off, actually. So by 2024, we'll have this first product to offer. However, we do already have three pilot projects lined up for the next two years for our smaller units. So we're just really excited for customers to get this in their hands. And with it, we can finally produce green hydrogen at $1.50 per kilogram within this decade by 2025. Join us at Alchemer in making green hydrogen a reality and electrifying the world. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Next, we have Paul from Heliogen. Hello, my name is Paul Gaucher, and I'm the vice president of our labs at Heliogen, a renewable energy technology company unlocking the power of sunlight uh, to replace fossil fuels. Today, I'll be talking to you about harnessing the planet's greatest resource and using it to, to de carbonize our world. Humanity needs to harness the full potential of the sun to power the energy transition. Sunlight is and always has been our primary energy source, supplying a continuous 99.98% of Earth's energy. That's 10,000 times more than we need as humanity. Sunlight is also our most evenly distributed natural resource. There are two key problems to solar energy. Solar energy is intermittent. Um, it only operates during the day. Um, and transport of solar energy is also uh, challenging due to the low capacity factors on our grid. And so we introduced the Heliogen Sunlight Refinery to solve these challenges. On one sixth of a square mile, this modular plant produces five megawatts of electricity near 24 seven or 850,000 kilograms of hydrogen per year. Why Heliogen? What makes us different? Our modularity is the breakthrough. It's done through six breakthrough innovations. First and foremost is our closed loop uh, tracking using artificial intelligence. It's a great breakthrough. Others include the high volume manufacturing capabilities and the low cost energy storage to create solutions uh, called the sunlight refinery that produce that have products associated called helio heat, helio power and helio fuel uh, for always available deep decarbonization solutions. But this session focuses on power. So helio power is our solution to deliver continuous power or power when it is needed the most, not just when the sun shines to electrify everything. So how does it work? As mentioned, our breakthrough uh, technology uses sunlight, artificial intelligence, and a modular cookie cutter design to deeply decarbonize industry broadly. A little bit more detail on that. Our novel heliostats field captures sunlight and reflects it to the top of the tower, where it's captured as very high temperature heat. We store that heat in a thermal battery, typically sand or rock, uh, to make it super cheap. That runs a process such as a supercritical CO2 power cycle. This is a picture of our artificial intelligence tracking system enabling the very high temperature 
we use the 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 way that the sun illuminates the sky and a bunch of cameras to extremely accurately point our heliostats. Next, we'll look at our modular configuration. Traditionally, CSP is done in large utility scale projects, typically 100 megawatts or more. And this impacts cost and um, project risk, something we want to avoid in our towers. In traditional CSP, those towers can be over 140 meters tall, and the heliostats can be as far out as a mile or more. For heliogen, the towers are 70 meters tall, and the field isn't that big, so it increases our optical efficiency a lot. Together with very small heliostats that go underneath the wind, that also lead to high volume manufacturing and our artificial intelligence that replaces steel, uh, we get to very low cost on our heliostat system. Because of what I presented on the previous three slides, we're also able to create extremely high temperatures at very low cost. That it's the enabler that leads to very deep decarbonization in all segments. Then we go to our thermal energy storage. High temperature storage provides the lowest cost. Uh, typically installed batteries cost in the region of $150 per kilowatt hour or more. Molten salt in CSP is in the $20 to $30 range. We're working on solutions that are below $10. And all of that leads to, coupled together, you get a unique enabler for a, the clean energy transition targeting less than five cents per kilowatt hour on electricity with capacity factors above 85% or more with hydrogen. Our technology maturation, we've been in business since 2013. In 2018 to 2019, we've developed our AI system and built our test facility. We're now ramping our manufacturing um, and developing projects with companies such as Rio Tinto. We're expecting manufacturing to ramp by 2025. So all of this is a natural fit. Heliogen's technology is the best solar solution available today, offering around the clock energy uh, based on the innovations that I mentioned before. So that is a low cost deployable system. We're exploring deployments all over the, over the world and welcome opportunities to green your operations cost effectively as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul and Lorraine. Just have a couple of questions for you here. Um, and for the audience, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat or in the Q&A. Now, Paul, with your always available refinery, you're targeting customers that are probably accustomed to a traditional refinery. How do you build trust that your technology works with you know, a demographic that might be more skeptical? Neka, that's a fantastic question. Um, interestingly, our modular solutions are already selling. We've uh, lined up um, customers uh, that are energy and industry giants. Um, and we have several projects in the pipeline where those large uh, companies are willing to take that journey with us. So for instance, uh, Rio Tinto um, is um, exploring a first project in Boron, California with us, um, and we're breaking ground this year. Uh, DOE has also contributed $40 million uh, to, to develop projects. So we're already on track to, to um, um, convince industry. Uh, that, that were a viable alternative. You both are using hydrogen in very different ways. Lorraine, where is the role of hydrogen in deep decarbonization? It's critical, right? If we want to get to our net zero 2050 quickly and in a economically viable manner, we need to avoid uh, major changes to some of the processes that we already run. And so that's where hydrogen comes in, right? You're already using a gas to run, to burn, whatever you're burning. You can use hydrogen instead and so on and so forth for other applications like aviation, where batteries for long haul distances just aren't going to cut it. I'll echo that, that the difficult to transition um, sector such as aviation uh, is a particularly good sector for hydrogen and when our mutual companies get below two dollars to our fantastic targets competing with um with um gray or black hydrogen um, it's 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 time for that transition absolutely and they're very complementary our two companies which i love right you have decentralized production that alchemer can serve heliogen can do that centralized production and decentralized so it's great where are you seeing kind of like geographic expansion? Um, Alkmaar, you're in Florida, headquartered, and uh, 
fall if you're in California. Um, do you think that it's kind of massive globally or are you seeing certain regions really driving change? So there are certain regions that have a lot of interest in it, whereas certain regions where there's actually, there's action. Um, so I would say the places where there are action, you could guess Europe, right? And then domestically in the United States, Florida proudly has two green hydrogen projects, um, surprising to a lot of the nation. And then Texas and California, I would say, are the two most active in adopting hydrogen. We're seeing a lot of interest in um, Australia because of yeah. how sunny that country is uh, for export to Japan primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an immense opportunity that by itself would um, um, uh, fill all our slots for the next 10 years. Um, but, but of course, we, we, we're finding a surprising amount of traction in the United States though as well, even though it's sort of batteries first in the United States, we're, we're, we're finding that the hydrogen game is picking up quick. So much. And I'm now going to open up the floor for our next two presenters, Astrid Atkinson of Camu Energy and Vic Shao of Ampli Power. All right. Uh, well, that's getting presented. Hello, everyone. I'm Astrid. I'm the CEO for Cameo Energy. Now, prior to co-founding Cameo uh, a couple of years ago, I was really fortunate to spend about 15 years of my career at Google, um, where I was a part of an early member of Google's reliability engineering organization. One of the things we were looking to do when we founded Cameo was really to leverage that experience in building, designing, and operating problems associated with the energy transition and really rethink how we manage our grids at scale. Now, there's a few observations that we can you know, sort of bring in from the software space, but one, one sort of bigger picture concern is that it's not always helpful just to kind of come in with new software, like uh, just bringing software to a traditional vertical um, often fails and often the more you pay for the software project, the less likely it is to be successful. So it's not just about coming and saying like, oh, we have software, we're going to bring it to the grid. It's really about bringing approach and a systems engineering approach that can pair up folks who are expert on the software side, um, along with people who are deeply expert in the industry that you're trying to you know, positively impact. So there's a few things that we kind of bring to the table at Camu that we think are potentially really transformative and really helpful um, in that grid transition landscape. Now, one of the, the first things that we thought is that when we were coming into the large to the large scale systems operation space, that you know we would come in and sort of help manage lots of distributed resources and manage the two way grid of the future and really sort of help people engage with that. But what we found when we came in was that actually visibility in the space is really low. And we came in and we're sort of like, hey, we can come, we can help manage all of your devices out there on the grid. And what we heard over and over from utilities was manage it, we can't even see it. So what we found was that actually like that foundational perspective on starting with visibility, it's just incredibly critical in um, providing utilities and folks within the broader grid landscape with the foundational capabilities required, not just to really understand what's happening in the grid today, but also to really leverage that data as you know, sort of the foundational platform for virtualizing the physical infrastructure of the grid in a way that can then allow it to be leveraged for kind of higher level operations, similar to the transformation that we've seen in the internet landscape, really kind of building businesses on top of that grid. Um, but one of the things that comes up when you talk about uh, sort of adding more people to the grid space or adding more technology to the grid space it's questions about security. Like, can it really be secure? Is it safe to add more things? And that's really kind of growing out of the traditional security model that's used in the grid space, which is really a perimeter-based model where it's like you really harden all of the boundaries and the edges around the, the mechanisms and the systems used for managing the grid. You don't let people in. Um, anything you add to that ecosystem, any other participants or kind of third parties, um, is an avenue for vulnerability. And that's really come up over and over again as we've seen vulnerabilities out there in the world, like the recent um, hack in the gas pipeline. But 
one of the big questions that I think is kind of missed there is just this idea of, you know, why are those core systems vulnerable? This is something where I also think there's you know, things we can learn from the big tech experience, which is just that a, you know, a, a contemporary approach to cybersecurity really leverages the ability to kind of separate concerns between parts of the system, really separate the system into a large set of pieces that can be managed hierarchically, kind of leverage the principle of least privilege, and really separate out all of those parts of the system. And so ultimately, when we think about sort of managing at grid scale or kind of adding participants into the grid landscape, a grid that's composed of a number of sort of self-healing participants, which are also self-protecting, gives us an opportunity not just to kind of leverage the grid from a you know, just a, a sort of grid modernization or smart grid perspective, but also to really set ourselves up for a grid ecosystem where lots more folks can participate. The grid can really be that platform for electrification and for modernization that it needs to be to kind of power the energy transition. So, you know, when we sort of look at the opportunities out there, we really think that like providing that ecosystem to provide visibility, not just to utilities, but also to customers and to aggregators and so forth, then that foundation for a more modern security approach um, lets us leverage existing technology that's like not revolutionary to kind of set up this next generation grid that's really friendly to involvement, not just from utilities, but also from third parties. So uh, thank you. I, I appreciate your time. It's really, it's really good to be here. Thank you so much, Astrid. Pass it on to Vic. Okay, great. Well, thanks, sir. thanks there, uh, Neka. And I really like what Astrid said about reliability, robustness of of the uh, enterprise software. At Ampli, we applied that to fee charging. So buses, trucks that are electrifying. Um, so several big problems when it comes to electrification. The first is fueling cost. You know, fleet operators are used to a scenario where costs go up or down by 20% in a year with diesel, with gasoline. With the electricity, uh, you know, it could be up or down by 400% in a single day. So getting a handle on that volatility in a mission critical fashion is truly important for the fleets that are uh, thinking about scaling up and adopting electric buses, trucks, light duty vehicles at scale. Um, so that's a big problem that we solve by automation, by software, and to make the infrastructure on charging infrastructure as reliable as possible. Uh, I don't think the slides are advancing. Uh, it's, uh, can, we, uh, can we click through to the next slide? Um, Second couple and third issues uh, have to do with the inter interoperability. I mean, we work with hundreds of fleets at this point. We have yet to come across a single fleet that only standardizes on one OEM's vehicles. Every single fleet out there operate a mixed fleet. So, you know, having a operating system software backbone that's managing across all the different hardware sets. Important. Um, so the landscape right now for a fleet operator is that they're handling a construction project. You know, they're dealing with all of the financing, all of the utility interconnect, and uh, and what Ampli is providing is a is a framework where Ampli is doing all of the work, and uh, and just letting the fleet operator handle their vehicle ops and handling their charging ops through Ampli in a reliable and consistent fashion. We do this through software. And, uh, and our software uh, platform is called Omega. That's handling the automation and giving uh, the customer 99.9% .9 reliability, uptime consistency on the charging experience at the lowest cost possible. Um, but the architecture for Omega is that it interoperates with the different vehicle types out there. It communicates with the existing enterprise applications, telematic systems that the fleet is currently operating and kind of stitch it all together into a, in, into a business workflow that is consistent, reliable, all the vehicles are charged, you know, 90% state of charge every single uh, working day and be ready by the time that they have to roll off the lot. Um, what I want to uh, talk about today, though, the focus of the, of the presentation is about an announcement that earlier this morning, Ampli made with Duke Energy Sustainable Solutions. And the solution is marrying uh, renewable energy with, with charging for electric buses. Uh, Duke uh, Energy is handling the solar canopy side of things and, uh, and providing a project financed 
uh, offering for solar canopy that's going over on top of a bus charging depot and uh, and all the construction activities and all the utility interconnect uh, you know Duke is handling that part whereas Ampli is handling everything on the charging infrastructure side uh, the construction the uh, the design uh, hanging the chargers off of the solar canopy and then of course using Omega to manage the automation there on after after the project is live um, we we jointly developed a, um, a, uh, a technology and it's patent pending with Duke, with Tycart, uh, that is bridging the gap and, just, and using the steel structure, the, the gantry structure for the dual purpose of solar as well as charging. And this is what it looks like. This is a cross-section view of what that system looks like. Um, it, is, uh, it is using the solar gantry to mount all of the chargers uh, and, and, and routing all of the cables uh, effectively throughout a given depot. Um, so this is really innovative and it's going to save the customer on cost and it's going to drastically improve the reliability of and, and automation of a charging system for electric buses. And best of all, all of this is powered by solar energy. So the customer has the expectation that everything that we're deploying is powered by renewable energy, it's reliable, it's consistent, uh, and, uh, and, and it's all project financed so that the customer is paying for the actual energy uh, produced, it is uh, the customer is paying for the actual energy consumed by the electric uh, buses in this case. Just for comparison, a typical gantry system for 100 buses would cost upwards of $5 million. And, uh, and it would only be for the purpose of hanging chargers off of it. And we're transitioning uh, the, you know, the, the, the landscape from something that looks like uh, just a seal structure to a solar canopy, project financed, consistent, reliable costing on the energy produced and uh, and you know using Ampli's Omega software, all the buses are charged, ready to go, every single workday. Uh, we're doing this already. Uh, we have uh, you know we we signed a agreement with Anaheim Transit, home of Disneyland, uh, last year to deploy a twenty year uh, solar and charging system on their brand new facility at Anaheim to deploy this, and uh, and and. Both and jointly, Duke and Ampli were guaranteeing the performance on solar, on the charging systems, uh, performance guarantees, as well as energy savings guarantees for the property over the next 20 years. So if you'd like to learn more, uh, we have another session coming up a little more than an hour at 1.15, uh, and we're gonna have all of the partners around the table and dive uh, deeper into the actual technology itself. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Vic. Uh, Vic and Astrid, I have a couple questions for you. And also, audience, don't forget, we have the Q&A tab as well as the chat function. Um, congratulations on your new project and new deal. I mean, where you started with your technology, you talked about fleet charging infrastructure and making things easy. How did you decide that this was the next step for Ampli when there's so many ways to go? Yeah, well, you know, we've worked with hundreds of fleets uh, across the country by now, and it's been pretty consistent what uh, what we're hearing from them. Uh, the desire to go uh, to power up electric vehicles using, uh, you know, renewable energy. Um, and in this case, it makes all the sense in the world. The same steel structure hanging solar panels from it as well as chargers. It's just more efficient that way. It costs the customers less. And uh, so it just, uh, it's just a very natural evolution of our uh, offering to the market. Uh, you're on mute, Nika. That is like the phrase of 2020 and 2021. <laughs> um, I'm always so enamored by your background, Astrid, how you take, you know, these different you know, mega trends and mega information and really like distill it into meaningful insights. And, you know, you've taken your background at Google and kind of transitioned your expertise into this world of, you know, energy infrastructure. 
I'm curious, are there any sorts of new patterns and trends that are emerging that are a little bit surprising from what you've seen? Um, well, one of the things that I think has been most interesting for us as we really started to engage deeply with folks who are kind of on the ground for the energy transition is how much of that is happening in rural communities. Um, and that's, that's particularly true in the US, but I think it's a little bit true um, globally as well. Uh, and a you know, big part of the reason for that is just that you, know, you tend to put renewable projects where there's space for them. And so they often end up going into places where there's a lot of sun or a lot of wind and a lot of space around them. But then we kind of run into these interesting challenges um, around kind of uh, rural communities finding themselves at the forefront of really big changes in the energy system and the energy economy. Um, and I think to me, like that's one of the most fascinating trends is not a technology trend at all, but actually like kind of a socioeconomic and uh, a sort of on the ground deployment trend. Um, the majority of utilities that we work with today are publicly owned rural community utilities. Um, and they are so far out ahead of some of the bigger utilities in the cohort. Just not to say that bigger utilities don't do innovation work, they do. But a rural utility um, you know, can go from sort of 20 to 80% solar over the period of three years. They can deploy a large scale new technology initiative in less than a year. That's something that bigger utilities just really can't manage. Um, but it also ends up bringing through a lot of the, um, a lot of ties into the community too, around moving economic development locally, um, around really incorporating the community from demand response programs and things like that. All these sort of technology initiatives that we tend to associate with cities and um, sort of bigger communities, they're really, really happening very fast on the ground um, in some of the rural communities across the country. So I think that's actually, that's my favorite thing. I, one thing that amongst other things that you have in common is that both Ampli and Cam, and I always call it Camu, is it Camus? It's Camu actually, yeah. Camu, okay. Thank you. Uh, Camu have in common is that they're doing a really good job of integrating these hard to integrate businesses, just the sheer data management and the information and kind of like the education of your customer. Can you talk a little bit about how, you know, you work with corporates and, you know, what that process is like in terms of integrating startup technology, if you will, into larger scale kind of complicated institutions? Yeah, good question. Uh, um, so our customers, as you pointed out, like, uh, are large institutions and, um, and businesses um, that, uh, that traditionally is difficult for a startup to, uh, to work with and, and penetrate. Um, I think, though, uh, everybody is recognizing that data is where the coming together it is the coming together. You know, the uh, large into large corporations and enterprises have had a hard time integrating the volume of data and making sense of it. So the end, they need help. And uh, and I think Adrit's platform as well as Ampli's platform uh, is serving a really needed uh, purpose in the space. And I think a lot of the customers that we work with really recognize that. Yeah, I, I guess to that point, I would just say that I think one of the most important attributes of a successful large scale IT integration project of any sort is that it needs to be really well aligned with the business goals of the organizations you're trying to integrate with. So one of the things that's been really key for us is just making sure that we work with customers who have a very clear value proposition for the work that we do and for whom that's like one of their top priorities as an organization to realize that. Um, whether that's like, you know, cutting energy costs to lower rates for their community or achieving decarbonization goals really needs to be kind of critical to their organization to make the, you know, the difficulties of an IT integration project worthwhile. But when those goals are aligned, we see that things can move quite quickly. And I think that's really positive from my perspective. Thank you. I'd, I'd now like to bring all of our speakers onto the stage and just to give some context, like I've worked at accelerators and you know utilities and now as an investor, you continue to hear great things about certain companies over and over again. And I think these four companies represent um, a level of excellence that's in the market right now as it relates to climate tech and companies that are really on the edge and so pleased to be here with them. So in the spirit of you know, good news and good things happening, I'd love to have my first question be, what's 
what's something great that's happened? Time to toot your own horn. Is there an announcement <laughs> or a breakthrough that you'd like to share with us? And uh, maybe I'll start with uh, Laureen. Sure, yeah. So anion exchange water electrolyzers have historically been limited to small stack sizes around you know, 2.4 kilowatts. Uh, and we have recently developed the largest single cell anion exchange electrolyzer. So the cell itself is two kilowatts, which is how we're able to get to those super large stack sizes. Uh, so that's really great and critical to being able to reach those low capital costs of you know less than three hundred dollars per kilowatt. So we're very excited about that. Paul, we're hiring, and uh, head over to heliogen.com and check out our careers page. Um, we're we've recently received some pretty good funding um, and we're growing at a, at a great rate uh, breakneck speed we've got a lot of projects going on so we need great people so it's a key key great news on our side uh, so i think um one of our recent milestones that we're really excited about is uh completing our initial early stage control deployment with one of our utility customers so there's obviously a lot, still a lot more work that can be done there, adding more device types and more sophisticated management, but actually having it kind of all the way out in the field and working in production is a really good milestone for us. Um, and so that, that's that been really exciting. Um, and they're wonderful. All of our customers are wonderful too. So it's been great. Um, but the other thing I would say is we are, we are wrapping up a funding round and we will be hiring as well in the near future. So that's pretty good too. Nick? Thanks, and um, and the announcement that we made this morning with Duke Energy obviously is very exciting. So come to Ampli Power, go to uh, Duke Energy Sustainable Solutions to check it out. Uh, I'll echo what Paul uh, said earlier about hiring. I mean, we are uh, we are seriously hiring at Ampli. So welcome to anybody out there that is uh, looking to join uh, Fleet Electrification. Um, and last thing I, I would say is that uh, for all of the companies here, I think it's really, really be exciting to see so much focus and attention on climate tech. For Ampli, it is uh, you know charging and electrification of fleet vehicles. But I think I, I think I probably speak on behalf of everybody that it's it's really exciting the environment that we're operating in and the attention on clean energy. I think yeah. I can say that this is the moment all of us have been waiting for our entire lives. <laughs> We have a, a couple questions from the chat, but I'll start with uh, for Lorraine and Paul. What sort of infrastructure is needed to get green hydrogen that's produced at your facilities to other locations where it can be used? That, that's a really good question and it is, is a big challenge. There are a number of different ways that that can be done. Initially, um, the existing gas infrastructure can be used to a limited extent, but it will probably need uh, quite a lot of adaption. Uh, th there are ways to compress hydrogen um, and ship it. There are ways to have distributed um, production so that it's closer to use. Um, and um, there are also alternative carriers for hydrogen, such as ammonia or other interesting chemistries. So, so there's a lot being done to, to look into that at the moment. Yeah, I'd add to that, that that question hits on a certain level of complexity, at least with electrolyzers. So where we place it, it could be on site at the customer's um, site or off site. And it really comes down to, is the customer located next to a solar or wind farm? If so, we should put it there. If they're not, then perhaps we'll generate the hydrogen at our facilities and then transport it. So there are so many factors that go into it and will be considered on a case by case basis. But that's not to say those aren't you know, manageable manageable um, situations. Yeah. And you know what's interesting is that some of you have talked a bit about regulations, but um, a benefit or sometimes a negative aspect of some of the fields that we're working in is that scale is kind of driven by, if not by market factors, then by regulatory factors. Are there any, you know, policies or regulatory changes or legislative changes that you're eyeing? Um, as it relates to scaling of your business? 
You know, one thing that um, I see as a pretty big barrier to significant change in the utility space is the current um, utility incentive structure that generates profit from regulated rate of return on capital expenditure. Um, one of the reasons why working with um, publicly owned utilities has worked so well for us is because they really care about cost of energy um, and they really care about system efficiency. And those are significant business goals that you can really optimize against. So if I was going to wave a magic wand from a regulatory perspective, making it easier for investor and utilities to care about those things would actually be my, my sort of biggest picture change that I could see being helpful. Yeah, and for electrification, uh, I mean, definitely no complaints. Uh, so a lot of attention and focus from state uh, legislators as well as federal are pushing uh, electric. And I, I would say that I, I'm really pleased to see the tier ones, Ford, GM, really getting into the act and um, and uh, and really, you know, help it propelling the industry forward. So I think a lot of positive momentum and tailwinds overall on electrification. Great. And uh, one last question as we wrap, there's a lot of corporate leaders in the audience. Um, what's one piece of advice or one tool that you would offer them as they are thinking about working with, you know, doing commercial contracts with or investing in organizations like yours? Um, one quick plug is to use buying power to force decarbonization for larger utilities. That's been a very successful force for change with a number of big IOUs across the country. And I think that that's something that I would really encourage people to continue to lean into. So that's that's not necessarily for me, it's kind of for everyone, but that that's a good use of power. Sorry, what type of power? Uh, sorry, pushing for decarbonization of energy supply for corporate yeah. customers from yeah. utilities. All right. Thank you. Another word is act fast. Don't keep waiting to see what the rest of the world is going to do. Um, you should be leaders and at the forefront of this effort. It will only help you in the long run and save on your costs. Don't wait for a carbon tax to come out. And I'll, I'll echo that is we're seeing a lot of uh, proactiveness from from certain sectors of industry, particularly those that are interestingly um, carbon intensive at the moment. I think there is a very clear message already that um, that change is needed urgently um, and and it helps the bottom line to change. Yeah, I think overall there's a lot to be done and um, you know get started. So much um, and thank you for Rebiz for hosting all of us. Please join me in applauding our wonderful guests. Thanks, Nika. <laughs>